Hello, I hope I can get this hints video done earlier than I had thought, so I'm going to try my luck. Now, homework nine is about functions, and I put out three videos on functions with the notes for them. Uh, let's begin with looking at the notes on functions two, because that has some of the things you need to know about. Uh, First of all, you can notice how I use functions in this first program. I have some functions that have return a value and some that aren't, that don't return a value. All the print row does is print something. It doesn't bring back a value. Int a fact and int com bring back a value. So that means when I use fact and com, I have to use them in some place where a value is useful. So for example, C out, or uh, in C out itself, you're going to see I used fact in where I could do an arithmetic statement. And these functions always get a return. Now, look at print row, though. Print row is alone on the line. It's going to just go down the print row, the function, and it's going to do the arithmetic down there. I mean, whatever's been asked. It prints out something. Notice there's no return statement. Now, you have a mix of functions in yours. Let me bring up yours uh, just to show you what you have here. Uh, here it is. Here are the rules. It must be a function input. It prompts for the imaginary and real numbers, reads them, and sends them back to the calling routine. So we'll have to look and see what that means in a minute. But look at the function output. Output prints two items. That means it's extremely similar to my print row function in the example in part two of the notes on functions. Then look at magnitude. Magnitude computes a value and returns it. That makes it very similar to my fact function, F-A-C-T, in the notes on functions part two. So those are the models you can use to see how to do those kinds of functions. There's one other function that returns a value, and that's the division function. It returns a Boolean. So it computes the Boolean, and if the mat, uh, it returns a true if the magnitude of the second operand is zero and false if not. And that just means if C is zero and D is zero, the second argument, uh, item, the one that is the divisor. So those are the ones, the two that bring back, uh, that return a value magnitude and division and so far we've had at least one that's totally void and all it does is print out the material but now there's more to this story so let's go back to the notes on function part two so let's look down here here's a function exchange we want exchange to take two arguments and swap them. We want to send in val1 and val2, and when we return, we want them to change. This brings up the difference between call by name and call by value. 
if you're going to use, uh, well, we can call it call by reference and call by name. Uh, if you're going to pass an argument that you want to change, in other words, when you return to the main line, that argument should have been changed by the function, then you have to pass the address of the argument. And all that means is that between the type of the object and the address of the object, you have to use the ampersand. Ampersand should be read as address of. So what it's doing is it's sending in where these two are. It's telling the function exchange here, val one's there and val two's there. Those are the things you use. When you change them, change those. And since they're the same thing as I have in my main program, I'm going to see that change. Now, if I don't put the ampersands in, then the first thing the program does is copy the values from val1 and val2 into some other place some private place for the exchange variable. A place I don't know about in the main line. And then it makes the changes in that private place. And when it returns to me, when it comes back to me, nothing has changed of the arguments I sent into it. Because I didn't tell it where they were. So again, that's the difference. If you want to change them, you need to have the ampersand. If they're not going to be needed in the main program or the calling program, don't put the ampersand in. So let's look at what that might mean for what these functions are. Let's look at input. Do you expect that input will return the real and imaginary parts of the number? I certainly do. I think that when input finishes, it will have read two values, the real part and the imaginary part. And when I get back to the main program, I want those values. Otherwise, why would I have called input? I need them. So I think you might think about ampersands there. You might think about call by reference. Now, let's look at output. You're going to send two values into it because it's got to print out a complex number, so it has to get the integer, the real part, and the imaginary part. But you don't want, you, you don't care. You just want, you want them to print out. You don't want them to change. You don't care if they change. It doesn't matter to you. So you don't put the ampersand in. Now I'm guessing the magnitude might be the same. Did I say I want to change the variables? I don't think I did. I just want you to use them. In other words, I want you to leave them alone. And that means you don't pass in by reference. Now, the other functions, the plus, the subtract, the add, I mean, uh, the multiply, the divide, each of them is going to have to have two arguments, and actually four arguments, pardon me. It's got to get two comp complex numbers. So it's got to get the real and imaginary part of the accumulator and the real and imaginary part of the second argument. So let me go back to where I can put down something. For, let's say, add to uh, imagine, um, complex numbers. We need to pass the 
real part of the accumulator the imaginary part of the accumulator the real part of the second argument of, of the uh, uh, other uh, uh, complex number and the imaginary part of the other number. The pro the that should have been real, pardon me. The add function. Does the addition uh, and the sum is in the accumulator when we return? So you need a line such as. Uh, Accumulator Rio equals accumulator Rio plus uh, second Rio. I'm not saying you have to use those names. But the, the variable that has to change is the accumulator. Now, think of what that means. You're going to have the, the function is going to have the form I'll, I'll give you this one void add and it's going to have four arguments so it's going to have the accumulator real the accumulator imaginary the second real and the second imaginary. Now I'm not telling you what goes here. I'll put, uh, let's put it this way. Fill in here. Now uh, where's it? Fill in. And you're going to do that fill in in front of each of them. I don't want to write it all for you, even though you want me to. And you're going to have to do the same thing here. And the same thing here. Now, what goes in there? Oops, pardon me. The fill-in will have the type and may have the ampersand. Some of these, some of the four arguments may uh, 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 let's put it, uh, I'll put it a different way you might want to have some of the four arguments changed when you return when you go back, uh, when you finish the function and some you may not. And that means that maybe not all of them are the same. In fact, all of them aren't the same. So you're going to be writing that kind of function 
about four times. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Now, multiplication and division have a little trick in them. And I want to show you what I mean. Let's say, uh, example, multiply 3 plus 4i times 6 plus 2i. Now, for ease of typing, I'm going to say I'm going to multiply A plus BI times C plus DI. It's easier if I just use those shorter names. And that's times. The definition says the following. The new A, oh, pardon me, the answer should be in A and B, since A plus BI is the accumulator. So I'm going to write A equals, the rule said that A should be A times C minus B times D. Now actually that's pretty easy to see. You're multiplying the A times the C and the D. When you multiply it times the C, you get a real number. AC. You're multiplying the BI times the C and the DI. When you multiply the BI times the DI, you get BI times, I mean BD times I squared. And I squared is negative one. Now what most of you have been trying to do, not all, but a few, is you now go B equals now, it's A times D, because it's A times DI, plus B times C, and you think you got the answer. You're wrong. Let me show you why. I've got, I'm going to do this now for A. <laughs> Uh, before I forget, I'm going to say, I want to make sure you understand the wrong way. Now, up there, I'm letting A, B3, B is 4, C is 6, and D is 2. A is. Now look what I've got here. If I go with what I'm doing there, I say A equals 3 times 6 minus 4 times 2, which equals 18 minus 8, which I believe is 10 although I'm not very good at arithmetic. Now, B equals 10 times 2 plus uh, B is 4 times 6, which is wrong. Did you see the problem? I need the original A. I need the A that was wiped out. So the problem is 
before I write A equals whatever, I must copy A to a temporary value and use a temporary variable, pardon me. and use that variable when I calculate B. Uh, we did something similar when we were swapping two elements. Before we could put A equal B, we had to do something like temp equals A to save it. Same kind of problem. This will happen in both multiplication and division. At this problem. All right, so that is, I think, the details on what's going on inside the functions. Now, I want to show you the output and then suggest how you might do it. So if you look at the handout for a fun, uh, uh, homework nine, you'll see I have a solution here. I wrote this, uh, I, uh, I wrote it a long, long time ago, uh, but I, I think I rewrote it recently, but it's there. Now, look at what happens. I have an option. I read in some, uh, I do something for the option. In this case, I read the real and the imaginary. And I print out the accumulator. I have another, I read another option. I input the real and imaginary part. If it's required, I print out the accumulator. I have an option. I read the imaginary and real part. And if it's and then I print out the accumulator, the magnitude. There's no input in real, uh, no new real and imaginary part. So I print out the accumulator. I mean, I print out the length, and then I print the accumulator. I keep doing that. In the division, I put in a zero to show you what happens. My function returns that it's a zero, and the main routine prints an attempt to divide by zero and does not change the accumulator, but it prints it. Now I have a division, and then I have a stop, and that's the end of the program. Now look at the loop. This is something you've got to do. You've got to start looking at loops. I see, ask for the option, get the option, perform whatever you have to do, print out the answer. Get the option, perform whatever you have to do, print out the answer. In other words, the loop has three parts to it. So my guess is that you're going to need something that looks like this. And I'm not going to write all the details of it, but let's see. Oh, I got plenty of room here. So what you're going to do is you're going to, re uh, you're going to repeat. Or you're going to do, uh, uh, I'd say repeat, uh, a while. And you decide what to put in there. So while it's true, you're going to ask for option and uh, input option. Then you're going to have a big if, if uh, whatever option equals clear, oops, pardon me, C, Blank. Then 
you're probably going to do an input and that. I mean, and, and uh, just input. You don't have to do anything else. Then the next step is going to be another L, an else if. The option equals, let's say, uh, plus. That it looks to me like what you're going to do is an input and uh, add. Now, when I write those down, that means I'm talking about calling the functions. You're going to have to call those functions. And then you're going to have else if and keep going and else if and keep going. And eventually you're going to have an else down at the bottom. And when you finish all of that inside the loop, you're now going to output the uh, accumulator. And all of that is under the loop. But notice, it's not under that else. Ah, uh, further. You, uh, if the option is S, you might just break as the command, uh, as the code. As break will get you out of the uh, if statements, uh, pardon me, out of the whiles, and then you can just return because your program's over. Now, what do you put in here? Something that is true all the time. I use one equal one. That's always true. It doesn't matter. No matter what I do, that's true. So that's the kind of looping I would suggest. Now, I may have given away too much here, but I still think you have some work to do. I haven't put all the details in. The most important part that you just plain have to start doing is looking for loops. Uh, in this case, I gave you a good chance to look for loops by printing out the example. Look at what is repeated every time. That's the way to find out what you want inside your while loop or your for loop or whatever you're doing. Now, I hope that helps. Uh, I'm going to put this out. Send me a note. If it helps, let, uh, tell me it helps. If it doesn't help, Tell me you want another one. We'll see what we can do. Okay? See you later. Bye now.